Welcome everyone today to today's Claris FileMaker 19.5 Under the Hood webinar. You've told us in your webinar surveys for the past year or so that hearing deep technical information about FileMaker helps you build better apps and have confidence in the FileMaker platform. With that in mind, we've invited many members of the Claris product and engineering team here to take a deep dive into our latest release and to answer your questions. You'll see some familiar and new faces, both presenting and answering questions in the Q&A panel and at the end of the session. We've planned plenty of time for questions at the end of the session. So please use that Q&A panel, send your question to all panelists to ask anything you are curious about FileMaker 19.5, and we'll answer as many as we can during today's webinar. And now I'd like to hand it over to Peter Nelson, Vice President of Engineering at Claris to talk about our intentions with the FileMaker 19.5 release and the FileMaker release calendar and cadence. Peter? Thanks so much, Rosemary, and thank you all for being here. Before I get into the release cadence, though, I do want to talk a bit about what our goal was for this FileMaker 19.5 release. When we met in April for the Roadmap webinar, we shared with you our vision regarding the Claris branded platform including Claris Studio. Today is not about Claris Studio. We are, however, going to focus on the FileMaker platform. FileMaker is the foundation of every single thing Claris is building. Our development community has based their careers on FileMaker for decades, and we expect to do so for decades to come. 19.5 is proof that we are committed to FileMaker for the long run. We've made significant investments in the platform to advance its feature set, so you can continue to create custom apps, integrations, and workflows for the future. We've boosted performance, speed, and productivity. FileMaker Server now supports Ubuntu 20.04 LTS. It runs on Nginx, the world's most popular high-speed web server. And you can count on FileMaker 19.5 to speed your productivity with new capabilities like save a copy as XML, summaries, and parallel backups performed on server. Providing even more platform extensibility, you now have access to industry standard integrations like OData that's now available on Windows, Mac OS, in addition to Linux, as well as other enhancements, including live text and QR code support, OAuth scripts for custom websites, and more. And finally, we strengthen security and reliability. FileMaker 19.5 includes more than 400 bug fixes. These improvements span security, installation processes, and calculation functions, as well as scripting, web direct, the admin API, and much, much more. So now let's talk about our platform release cadence. Since the initial launch of FileMaker 19 in May 2020, we've released four major updates to the FileMaker 19 platform, 19.2, 3, 4, and now five. We release updates to the FileMaker platform at least twice a year, but we've been on a pace to hit about three to four times a year since the first release of 19. Typically, we focus on a major product line for each dot release, FileMaker Server for one, maybe FileMaker Pro and Go for the next. But these releases have made significant improvements to the performance scalability and reliability of the FileMaker platform at a much faster pace than when we were only produced one annual release each year. We expect to continue with this pace going forward. And now I'd like to invite Lucy Chen to tell you more about what we're doing. Thank you, Peter. I am very excited to take you under the hood and tell you the engineering what and why we did this in 19.5 release. Since 19.0 release, Claris Engineering transformed into Agile development model. You saw from Peter, our release cadence has been three to four times every year. We have been releasing fast. We reacted to your request with high velocity. In 19.5 alone, 
we fixed more than 400 bugs. These bugs improved performance, scalability, reliability, PSR. These bugs covered across Draco, calculation, scripting, web direct, security, admin API, installer and upgrader. We have backup enhancement. We heard from you. We fixed critical bugs and added parallel backup, cancel backup. 19.5 server runs on Ubuntu 20, Ubuntu 18, Mac and Windows. We fixed security vulnerabilities from multiple sources such as replaced worker admin console for secondary server. We now support elliptic curve cryptography, ECC certificate for higher encryption strengths, such as P384. We integrated live text and QR code for Pro on Mac OS, Go on iOS. We know you love OData API since it became available in FileMaker Cloud and FileMaker Server on Linux. OData API is, not avail is now available on FileMaker Server, Mac, and Windows. Here's a sample of OData. In addition to Data API, XDBC, you now have another way to interact with FileMaker Server. That is OData. It's a natural evolution of industry standard APIs from ODBC, JDBC to OData. Engineering blogs for 19.5 release covers a lot of these good information. Let's talk about FileMaker Server on Linux. FileMaker Server 19.5 server runs on both Ubuntu 18.04 and 2004. It is the first time we release two versions on Ubuntu. Next release will be Ubuntu 20 only. The reason we did both for this version is for you as developers. You need time to try and test the solutions with server on Ubuntu 20 while running your current solution in production on Ubuntu 18. We build Ubuntu FileMaker Server with Plan 12 compiler. We use third-party libraries from Ubuntu 20 directly whenever possible. We removed duplicate libraries from Ubuntu 18. We did the cleanup work for you. As admin, you can update, patch these Ubuntu third-party libraries when a new patch is available from open source. Open source. Palmica server on Ubuntu supports Nginx as web server. It's fast. But wait, we support both Nginx and Apache 2.4. You can choose Nginx or Apache in Palmica server on Ubuntu 20. Go to engineering blocks for more details. We support HEIC thumbnails on Ubuntu 20. HEIC is a high efficiency image format on iOS and macOS. This is to support your Go client on iPhone, iPad with container images. We have seen more people use FileMaker Server on Linux for better performance. It's fast in our QA test. We suggest you try your solution with FileMaker Server on Linux if you haven't done so. FileMaker Server. We have four major enhancements for server on Mac, Windows, and Linux. Server side summarization. You can cancel backup. We made parallel backup better. If you turn on the parallel backup option in FAC, both progressive backup and full backup will use multi thread with the most recent file set files in your backup process. When we implemented these in our Agile Sprints, we QA'd, reviewed, and made sure we improve PSR. 
we did a lot of PSR testing. Our community members also did performance tests. We know all solutions are unique. The results all have been better on 19.5 release for Mac, Windows, especially Linux. Server side, save as XML. The script step can be executed from FileMaker client, and now you can also use FileMaker server to schedule a script to run, save a copy of XML on server. Here's a demo to show you save XML on pro and server. First, save XML on pro client. This is a real test in real time. Save XML on pro locally is great, very practical. With collaboration from a team working remote these days, like this one, it's taking a little bit of time. Saving XML on pro client. Now it's done. It took 35 seconds to save on pro client. Now we do the same on server. It took only a quarter seconds, 0.26 seconds. That was done on PSource, executed remotely on SASE. That's our script engine. You now can use save XML on server. One partner told us that they use save XML on pro for their customers. It's a big job every week, took about four hours a week and many hours a year. With save XML on server for the same task, he said it will save him two weeks a year. That is 80 hours saved. He was very excited. Next, let me invite FileMaker Server Architect Wade to tell you under the hood for server. Wade. Thank you, Lucy. Good morning. I'm Wade. Uh, we are going to look into under the hood for server and the web direct. We introduced sort on server in 19.1 and 19.2 timeframe. As requested, we have a summary on server in 19.5. There are several considerations to check whether it is favorable to do summary remotely on server with considerations like unstore calc, plug-in custom function, global field, ESS, if any of them is involved in summary calculation, it will not be sent to server to execute. Finally, it checks server CPU usage for the current server loading. During client and server communication, we embedded server CPU usage in back channel packet for client to understand the current server loading. The back channel communication will happen at least once in a minute. Client sends the request to server when server is not heavily loaded, like 25% or below in CPU usage. The algorithm dynamically makes decision for you. As Lucy mentioned, we also have a perform script on server support for the save as XML script step in 19.5. To empower FileMaker script engine running heavy duty scripts on server, we have an enlarged server script engine internal cache size from 64 megabytes to 256 megabytes. Also enlarged sending thread pool from 40 to 100 and fix several data racing bugs in 19.5. Now we are going to see a quick demo comparison between remote summary versus local summary.
we have a we have a comparison side by side. The left hand side is a remote summary executing on server. The right hand side is a local summary on pro. You can see the timer and the progressive bar for both. So the remote summary almost closed and actually it finished in 15 seconds. And the local summary actually making pretty good progress right now. You can see the status from the progressive farm. Okay, so local summary finish as well in 36 seconds. So you can see roughly we got like a 60% improvement in this test case. The next topic is, is under hood for backup in 19.5. First, start from transactions. The idea is to learn from transactions for related databases into an internal structure file set. A file set basically contains a group of related databases. When a FileMaker client sends a transaction to a FileMaker server, server can learn related databases from transaction to update file sets. Initially, all databases are in the default file set zero. When there is a transaction coming from a 19.5 client, new groups of files will be created or updated in a file set. When there are more and more transactions from 19.5 clients, server will have a more accurate groupings of databases in file sets. By using file sets, backup service only needs to pause related databases of the file set. As you know, pause database is a critical locking mechanism to guarantee integrity. By limiting the scope of post databases in backup can help server throughput, client response time, and also backup itself. All FileMaker clients, including Pro, Go, WebDirect, Data API, XDBC, and OData send transactions to server. Except Pro and Go, all the rest are bundled in server. We would recommend you to upgrade to 19.5 Pro and Go in line with 19.5 server to help the learning process of a file set and integrity, and also take advantage of the improvement. Along with file set, we make backup run in multi three. We can you can turn on the option of parallel backup on FileMaker Admin Console. When you enable the parallel backup option, both full backup and progressive backup will use file set with multi three. Parallel backup will have a bigger improvement. If you have hardware like a storage array network, network attached system, or read based disk array, if you don't enable parallel backup option, backup will perform as prior versions. You can choose the option suitable for your system. The backup files will be the same. Besides, we have a fixed couple of backup bugs in 19.5 applicable to both options. If you enable parallel backup and there are transactions from old version of Pro or Go, server will log warnings in event log for your reference. Backup can take a long time. As requested, we added a cancel backup option. When the cancel backup button is clicked, FileMaker Admin Console sends it asynchronously to server, and the server will cancel backup in the earliest possible time when it can abort backup, and then clean up incoming backup files accordingly. Now let's take a look at a quick demo between parallel backup and the single thread backup. So in this te test case, we, we, run, we run it on a Mac with a single SSD drive. 
First, let's look at the single three backup. Yeah. So we using the CLI to start the backup. And you can see the status from the event log. Uh, to set time, we fast forward it 40 times. You can see the timer on the screen. Uh, so in this system, we totally we have 110 files. So the backup finish in roughly six minutes and a half. Now that, let's do the same thing for a parallel backup. Uh, so the same the same we in the we start backup from the command line. And you can see from the event log, there are a lot of the file set information sh showing up. So totally the 15 files got changed, roughly about 2.6 gigabytes. So the parallel backup finished as well in roughly four and a half minutes. So you can see there are 33% improvement in this quick demo. So the performance might be different uh, on your system, uh, depends on your environment and also files and setup. Next, we are going to discuss under the foot for web direct. Web publishing engine generates CSS for layout components on, on the web. We have a four layer cache system. Database server has cache for FileMaker layout objects. C++ web publishing component, also known as a CWC of the web publishing engine, generates CSS of a FileMaker layout object for browser to, to display. CWC has a cache for the generated CSS layouts. Java Web Publishing component of the Web Publishing Engine, also known as JWC, behave as a middleman between CWC and browser, maintains its own cache with size 30, uh, primarily for browser requests. And browser keep their CSS along with other assets like HTML images and JavaScript in the browser cache. The cache algorithm is based on database, layout ID, view style, and the layout mark count. If uh, an attribute of layout got changed, the layout mark count will be changed as well, and it will trigger the, the cache update through this uh, four-layer architecture. There are dimension-sensitive objects like tab control, slide control, and auto resize container. CSS layout cache need, needs to cache dimension dependent entries. As dimension CSS layout needs to store cache entry for each dimension, it's heavier than dimensionless CSS layout. It would be good to have it in mind when designing your solutions. The next topic is custom OAuth. We released custom OAuth in 19.4. Now we provide simple HTML and JavaScript files showing how to make custom login page with a custom OAuth on web direct. So you can download the, download this file. Uh, and if you need the detail, please see the engineering blog. Now I'm passing it to Crave for more under the hood. Thank you. Well, thank you, Wade. Hi, I'm Clay. Uh, I mainly a software architect on the FileMaker side of things. And I'm going to go over some of the features that are in the, the, the 95 uh, release and going into more details. So the, the, uh, some of the featured changes that we've been advertising uh, is the new live text and QR support. These come from uh, Apple uh, technologies, so they're only available on the uh, Mac OS, iOS, and iPad OS. Um, they give you additional functions. There's a get live text, you give it a container, it returns and which language you think the text is in, and it'll return the text on the image. 
Uh, there's a read QR code, you pass it a container, it can return uh, the, the information that's part of the QR code. So these are handy features for, especially for iOS devices, as you're going around and taking pictures of things and wanting to uh, scrape the text or the QR codes off uh, solutions like in inventory or warehousing and stuff like that. Uh, we've also, uh, we had some customers come back with uh, problems that they were having in some security vulnerabilities with the FMP protocol. Basically, you know, phishing, putting out link FMP protocol links in uh, coming from non uh, IT people or from people that would fire off and open up a random database. So uh, I'll get into more details of what we're doing with that. And then the, the, the last two here are really a bit more about uh, uh, improvements that we're doing on the Windows side. So we're not just doing work on the, the Mac and uh, uh, iOS and iPad or Linux. So uh, we've finally gotten rid of all the previous usage of Internet Explorer. There were still three more web viewers, embedded web viewers in the product, mainly for doing uh, logins and um, README slash license uh, content to display. So we're now on the Windows side all the way up to uh, the, the new Microsoft Edge browser technologies. Also, we've updated the uh, Sparkle upgrade mechanism to the latest uh, version that's uh, stable on the Windows side. So I, I don't know if we're going to ever go this far on the Mac and Windows side where you can update the third party software automatically, like uh, Lucy mentioned that we're doing that with uh, Ubuntu. Linux is kind of a different place where people are expected to upgrade their environments and stuff like that. But on the Mac and Windows side, the, the infrastructure there to do automatic updates like that, uh, things are, it, it's better if we do the updates and package it with the software on that side. So now let's go on and uh, get into a little bit more details on some of these things. But, as I mentioned, uh, we have this new FMP URL protection. Um, where you see this, well, let me go first into why we did it. Uh, I guess some people have been worried that uh, you could have a link um, on a web page that would go through, the user would just click on it for some reason, they didn't know why. It would uh, launch FileMaker, it would open up that database. And then once that database is open, um, it could do a bunch of different things depending on what the scripting environment uh, is uh, set to. So we now have the ability to uh, uh, control uh, which URLs uh, get executed. And it works very much like how uh, uh, secure certificates work. Uh, like if you connect to a, a server that has a out of date certificate, we'll, we'll put up a warning and, you, and the user can say yes or no, or uh, and then if they say yes, they say, oh, remember this server, I always want to connect to it because I know this is a self-signed certificate and I just want to use it. Same with plugins. Uh, we have the same type of uh, certificate checking on plugins. If there's an unsigned plugin that you're using, we bring up a warning. And if you say yes, you're given an option to remember it. Uh, and now this is going to be the same and an optional feature for the FMP uh, protocol too. Um, you'll be asked whether you want to continue uh, uh, using this uh, uh, URL that, uh, or this particular host that you're talking that you trust it, save it in the list of trusted hosts. Hosts. Now, by default, this is off because there's quite a few people using this as part of their workflows. But if you're in an environment where you are concerned about there, there's two ways to turn this on. First, in like the preference dialog box you see on the screen, there's now a new checkbox at the bottom of the permitted list that you can turn the feature on. Also, if you're an IT administrator, you can go the um, during the installation of uh, FileMaker on either Windows or Mac, you can use uh, the insisted install file to set this AI warn FMP URL flag and set it to one, and I'll turn on that option for that installation. Uh, there's, um, if you don't know about the assisted install document, it's uh, documented in the uh, network install setup guide. There's a bunch of flags in there for controlling the, the installation of a FileMaker app, and you can turn particular flags on and off, like stopping them from being able to create new files. And there's a whole bunch of interesting options in here that some of you guys may have never seen that you may be interested in, especially if you're doing mass installations. So, okay, we'll go on to another feature that wasn't in the, the list before, but we're, 
going to be talking about um, uh, the, the new JSON get element type function. Um, this function, one of the reasons it was added is uh, there's been, there was quite a few discussions going on. People were using different JSON functions to like determine if the JSON was valid. Um, they were complaining that if they did a JSON get element call and it would return blank, but they really didn't know whether it returned blank because it wasn't there or because they gave an invalid path. Um, and as we've learned uh, recently, uh, it's really hard to change the behavior of any calc function because there'll be someone using it some way that is very unexpected. So instead of trying to you know, change these other functions to do other things, we decided to just add a new function called JSON get element type. So uh, this thing, I mean, by default, this thing you give a JSON chunk, you give it a path, and it'll tell you what the type is at that location, at that index path. Um, it will also return errors all the time if the path is invalid or the object is, if there's no object at that path. Um, so you can now determine if something is actually there or not versus just that uh, there is no default value that you should be using. It also, uh, like another use case that we saw people using pretty often is they would use the a JSON format elements function just to validate the JSON, just you know, do a quick validation. If you didn't get an error from that, you would say, oh, the JSON is good. Now, unfortunately, the format would also validate it and then format it. Uh, JSON set elements will actually be faster. If you just say JSON set element, return me the root of the node, you should be getting either an array or an object type back, uh, or you'll just get an error. But it won't be spending the extra time of actually doing the formatting if all you really want to do is determine whether the whether it's valid JSON or not. And uh, okay, then we'll head on to the next uh, thing I want to get deeper into. Uh, we've talked about yeah that we have now save a copy that can now be executed on the server side and the um, on the server side scripting engine, but also we've been making a lot more tweaks uh, in the the output. Now, originally, when we were coming up the, 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 I guess you can kind of call it XML2, I guess, um, we were thinking of having different flavors of the XML, one for the database design reports, one for doing add-ons, um, and another for the, the update tool. But that, that's been, that turned out to be a lot more complex to try to keep managing on our side. So. We've kind of changed our direction on what we're going to be doing with XML and we really just have one new format. And then we'll pretty much deprecate what uh, is generated by the, the DDR, I guess what I call the DDR1 format, the current one when you do the DDR report, you get this XML chunk. We're hoping that this new format, which I tend to call DDR2, um, as the, the, the replacement for that. So we've been working with the different vendors that have been um, uh, that process the current DDR, uh, adding some of the stuff that they want, bringing features from the DDR into the, the save as copy XML output that weren't there before, and making some other tweaks and also fixing bugs that were in that place. Um, even on the DDR1, we're fixing some bugs in the new version, the, the new XML version. Uh, so just as a kind of a, a kind of sampling of things that were changing, and I've shown the diffs between uh, the output from the same file between the, the older version of the save as XML and the new version. You don't have to really look at it that closely, but the first one is uh, we realized that, you know, we were putting the timestamp in at the top. So every time you made the copy, it would be different. The XML would never be the same between two. And if you're using this to, as doing change control, trying to determine whether something changed, you would always, you would never have something the same. So if you're, you know, just want to see if nothing changed in your file and the scheme and all that stuff, you could just save it out do a diff if it's if it says there's no changes and you know that nothing's changed previous to this version uh, you would always get a difference at least uh with the the time stamp in there uh the, the, the little second chunk there is there's been places where the uuid wasn't being outputted in this case it was the data source reference uh we're now outputting trying to make sure that we are outputting the the, the correct or the the uuid for the particular object sometimes it was putting out the uuid for what the object was from and not what it was actually referencing. So we're, we're trying to, I, I think we've gone through and cleaned that all up, but um, 
uh, we're, we're still working with some of our uh, the vendors that process DVR to make sure that this is all correct now. One of the bigger changes is in the third chunk, um, and this was, has always been a problem in our XMLs, is that there's in XML there's this escape sequence called the C data escape sequence, which is a alternate way to escape embedded characters that uh, are used by XML, and it, it's really bad to um, try to recursively include a C data inside of C data. So if you were actually trying to do C data in calculation functions and then output it, the calc on the left in that third chunk is actually really invalid XML. You can't really have a C data and a C data like that. You have to escape the internal one. Basically what we're doing in the new XML format is if we detect a C data escape sequence in what we're trying to generate to the XML, we, we, will, we will not do the C data escaping mechanism and just go back to the official escaping mechanism. It's not as nearly as pretty, but it doesn't run into the problems of the parsing problems and generating back that XML for other uh, processors. Also, I mentioned that we're bringing uh, functionality from the DDR1 to the DDR2. Um, and in this case, you can see now that we're adding the chunk list and the chunk data types. And also, we've added a hashtag in there because that was requested by some of the vendors so they can determine, so they can look for duplicate uh, calcs that may be spread off in multiple cases. They'll all have the same hash. So there's more analysis that they can do on the, uh, on the XML X, uh, uh, content. And the last change at the bottom is really just bugs that were in the um, XML2, especially if there was references to other objects that were in other files. On the left, you see at the bottom there, it says table missing. The, the table wasn't really missing. It's just that it didn't know how to handle references in other files. So now it'll spit out that, oh, the, I was dumping a file called uh, file X, and now it says, oh, this table occurrence is a reference to an object in uh, file Y, and here's the UUID of that object over in that file. So we've been going through and uh, cleaning up the output and kind of changing our strategy for what we're planning on doing for the XML. There's going to be basically one XML format for all these different types. Um, okay, I think we'll go on to uh, some of the, the blog changes we're doing and I'm starting to get close to the question. So I um, wanted to mention, um, so here's the, the five new blogs that have been uh, put up recently. And one thing I want to mention about these blogs is that um, these blogs are being written by the actual engineers. Um, now, the final content that you see has been uh, gone over with a, uh, a comb basically to fix our poor English skills by our instructional media group. But the actual content is coming from the, the engineers being processed and then uh, put on the websites and stuff like that. And we're planning to keep continuing doing more. Um, there's a pretty long list up there already. Um, we have the, the OAuth uh, document that uh, uh, Wade was mentioning. We have the upgrading document for upgrading server to Ubuntu because there are there are differences between uh, going from Ubuntu 18 to 20. I, I wouldn't really consider that 18 and 20 are really the same operating system. These Ubuntu's, when they do these upgrades, quite a few things change. Um, they're not really the same thing. You know, we kind of consider them as separate ones, separate OS's really. Um, then we talk about the new get live text functions. Uh, I think there's also one for uh, some of the other new functions too that are coming up. There's the parallel backup going into some of the reasons why you would do it, how it works, uh, what goes on there. And then uh, some more documenting of the uh, calculating summary fields uh, on the host, which is actually very similar to when we do the, the sorting on the host side too. Uh, but the, the rules are pretty much the same, but uh, th there are some differences that that goes into. Now, where to find all these things? There's, uh, if you go to the community website, there's a Plaris Engineering blog um, section in the middle there. It'll have the most recent blogs uh, up there at the top, and then there'll be a place that you can click at the bottom. They'll take you to the list of all the blogs if you want to see them all. And uh, the um, there's some, I, I didn't realize, I just looked at it recently, I didn't realize that the list has gotten so long at this point. So there's there's quite a bit of good information there if you want to check it out. You may want to go there first before, um, or just to read there, you'll, you'll learn new things. Um, so that's all uh, from the engineering team. Thank you. And let's hand it back to Rosemary for uh, questions and answers.
Oh, where's my game muted? Never fails. I always forget to unmute. Um, but thank you, Lucy, Wade, Clay, and Pete for that deep dive into FileMaker 19.5. Um, you've been filling us with um, questions, and as you've seen, I'm sure we've seen some in the chat, and I just want to reiterate what I what I put into that Q&A thread. We're going to publish that list, the transcript of everything we answered in the, in the Q&A panel back to the community um, later this week. And so if you still have questions, you have a few, few minutes to ask them. But to get started, um, I have a couple of questions for Rick. Um, first, several people asked about this also. The community has identified several issues with FileMaker 19.5. Um, so a two-part question, is there an update planned in the near future? And second, can you give an idea of which of those issues will be covered in that update? Uh, yeah, thanks, Rosemary, uh, and I'll try to be as brief as possible so we can get as many questions in. Uh, but yes, we are aware of some issues we introduced in the 19.5 release um, with the dot one, um, and uh, we will uh, very quickly release a 19.5 um, dot two. Um, some of the areas um, that this will address uh, is the replace field contents uh, getting uh, slower. Um, the um, Printing and saving PDFs when layout objects have visibility um, controlled um, were some issues there, so we'll address that. Um, we made some changes to fix a bug to add-ons without quotes function and, and got feedback that that broke a lot of uh, deployed solutions, so we will revert that. Um, there's other things like um, the um, when you're using calculations and accessing container data, uh, the scripts um, engine can stop responding. Or if you're using Ubuntu 20.04, um, yeah, the server can stop responding if you're sending SMPT, uh, SMTP email. So we'll address um, all of those ASAP. Um, this is something that um, we expect to get out within the, the, the next few weeks um, to, to address the top ones. Okay, thanks, Rick. And another question that was comment asked in the community and in the Q and A is when will FileMaker Server be supported for Windows Server 2022? Yes, that's uh, definitely on our, our back list. Probably looking at uh, FileMaker 19.6, roughly um, late summer, early fall um, is what we're looking at. Uh, All right, and uh, last one for Rick for now is. Will Claris document all 400 bug fixes for developers? Um, that's again, as you know, been another really popular question. Yeah, so uh, what I'll, I'll say there is it's, it's a balance between uh, the effort uh, to document that and clearly word um, how, because internally um, bugs aren't always worded most clearly. So it's pretty labor intensive. Our release notes do, however, have about 150 of those 400 articulated and, and worded. Um, we also on, on the community and in the, in the partner page have uh, known issues um, that we are constantly keeping up to date. Um, so the, the likelihood of us going back in and articulating all 400 of those um, are uh, probably not going to happen. Just it's just a resource constraint versus what else those resources can work on. Um, but um, the 150 of the top ones we think that would make the, the most difference to you have been called out in the release notes. Thanks, Rick. Um, and this is a question for, I think, Clay is the best to answer it. And that is, for summaries on FileMaker Server, how is CPU usage evaluated? Um, so, for example, if a server has 10 cores, um, performance tools calculates 10%, 100% per core, so the max capacity is 1,000%. Um, in this case, is the summary load calculated when CPU load is lower than 25% or lower than 250%? Um, yeah, this is, this is really complex because every operating system and every tool you use on the same operating system will give you different numbers because everyone presents load differently based on, you know, the number of processors. So. We have our own way of measuring it. It may not be the same way as any particular tool. I mean, even on the Mac, you can run three different tools and get three different values of what the CPU load is. 
on that machine. And the other operating systems are that way too. Um, we, um, basically the summary function is working exactly the same way as the sort function. It uses the same load. So there's nothing, the, the load measurement is exactly the same way that when we determine whether we do the sort locally or not. It's 25% based off the, uh, the API calls that we're making. Now, how that is reflected by any other API that you're calling uh, or any other app you're using to see the amount of usage um, uh, may vary, but uh, we we tend to be tuning this more by from our um, how our QA sees how it's using and how the load seems to handle. So I really wouldn't worry too much about the exact percentage. Um, if uh, we we tend to you know when you pounded things heavily, we we try to make it so that we don't overload the server. Um, so we we we. To tweak that number when we want and stuff like that, but uh, I guess that's a very long answer for um, that question. So get back to Rosemary. All right. So Wade, we had several questions about parallel backups, um, and so I think we'll spend a few minutes diving into that. Um, so the first question is, why would someone not want to do or use parallel backup? And specific, and also, why is it not turned on by default? Yeah, good question. The, yeah, the, the the reason we we don't don't put the parallel backup as a default is, well, as you know, this is a new feature, right? So, so in the way is is we want to give you option. So, the if you ask me, I will recommend to turn it on. However, there are some consideration. Say in case you need to to migrate the pro and go all the pro and go migrate in phases. So if you have that, some in some corner case depends on configuration. The the pause database might not be able to pause all the related databases. Remember, this the idea is purely from learning from the transactions. So in a way the. To answer the question is uh, different. I would recommend you to turn on the switch and uh, use it, use it, and and to see a result. We print out quite a lot of, of messages in the event log, and from there you can see your the system. And if you run in, if you see a problem or question, feel free. Let us know. Thank you. Okay. So another one on the same files are batched into groups. So if you have about 35 files in your overall application and the files are all connected, some more than others, will that always be one file set for the, the parallel backups or are there times that they might not all go as one file set? Yeah, yeah, good question. <laughs> yeah, so so this probably if you say all the 35 files are connected to this is probably kind of like a, a corner case so so the thing is the 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 system will learn from the transactions so in the way is it, it will it will try to group group these 30 files in group when we see see the transaction coming with related files. So initially, unless say all the transaction all involve all 35 files, otherwise you probably can see the pro the progress of the grouping of files happening going on. So when we say like a, maybe for example, maybe the the it's during the first day we see the 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 group of come the we we probably see group of say like ten files involved in transactions. So when when that happening for the ten files, we can we can in, run in parallel in multi thread for these ten files during the backup. Okay, and then one last question on multi threaded backups. Um, so if you have one single large file, will that be backed up in a single thread or multiple threads? Single three. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, next is a question about canceling backups. And I think Keith said he could answer this one. Um, when you cancel a backup, is disk space restored or is the partial backup left in place? Okay, so during, while the schedule is running, it's collecting data and, and uh, performing your backup as you request it. So you'll get your databases and you'll get your container data being pushed to disk. When uh, you cancel the backup, it's gonna turn around and undo everything it just backed up. So it will remove all the databases and also remove all the container data cleaning up your hard drive. Okay, so thank simple. you. Um, next one is for Clay, and this is specifically about um, PDF container behavior on Windows. Um, so when we made that change from in Internet Explorer to Microsoft Edge, um, you lost some of the features like the open and print pop-ups and ability to navigate and zoom in PDFs. Um, have those features been restored in FileMaker 19.5? Um, no, it hasn't been restored in 19.5. Microsoft is still under active development for uh, embedded web viewers for the Microsoft Edge. Um, uh, they're in the, the latest uh, unsupported version, the version that they're working on, there is some more features that may be able to help us. I'm not quite sure whether they'll fix this one, but um, I think we're, we're going to be able to fix drag and drop issues and stuff like that. They're finally giving us control over drag and drop. The, the thing is that the the IE embedded web stuff was uh, you know, very full featured and stuff like that. And when Microsoft gave the new embedded edge uh, control, it basically had a very it had a subset of all the features that IE had. And unfortunately, we used a lot of features that the IE did. So we're waiting for Microsoft to finish implementing um, all the other hooks that we need to add in menus to do things like that. Um, and to have more control, um, we're, we're still fighting over the, the uh, being able to grab stuff. You can grab it if it's a real edge, if the edge viewer is actually displaying the data. But when edge is displaying a PDF, it's actually firing off a separate, completely app, different application and running the PDF there. And we have very little visibility into what that other application is doing to render the PDF. And that's, problem, that's some of the problems we're having with con, uh, control over it. But Microsoft does have a um, have these uh, pre-releases of future versions of the APIs that are coming up. I have checked them out and built them, and I check every so often to see if we can fix certain things with it. And I'm not quite sure when they're going to release there. You know, when they do an official release, uh, so we can't tell you when we'll be able to get to it. But we are watching what Microsoft is doing, and as soon as they can support it, then we'll add it to FileMaker. All right. Thanks, Clay. And we have uh, one last time for one last question, and this one is for Lucy. Um, it sounded like you recommended staying with Ubuntu 18 for production and using Ubuntu 20 for testing. Um, is that your general recommendation or are there times when you would want to use Ubuntu 20 in production? So here, um, Ubuntu OS are very different from Mac OS and Windows OS. If you look at Ubuntu 18 and Ubuntu 20, there are two different OS. Clay mentioned that in the uh, in his talk. So when we did our version, we look into that. We cleaned up a lot of these uh, 18 and 20. We realized that we really have to give it a good look. When we look at this, we decided that we released two versions on Ubuntu. And for you, we would recommend that you test your solutions on Ubuntu 20, give it a good test, because a lot of these libraries are different from the 18. So that's why we give you the two release, and you should give it a good test. When you are ready, you transfer. Otherwise, you might want to stay your production 18 for the time being when your 20 is ready. That's the recommendation. 
Yeah, let me say something about it. If you're using 20 and you're testing out there, I wouldn't be too worried about the overall stability. You'll probably find some edge case that doesn't work, you know, because you're, you're using, you know, the, the Ubuntu 20s version of the imaging processing code. So maybe, you know, this one type of, a, you know, a animated GIF will not work. So, so those are the type problems you would probably run into on 20. I, I would call them all edge conditions. Now, if your solution depends on one of these edge conditions, um, then yeah, clearly don't move to 20, but um, for overall general usage, I wouldn't be worried about going to 20, but there may be some edge conditions that may affect your particular solution. All right, well, thank you, Lucy, Clay, Rick, Wade. Keith um, and everybody else on the team who is answering questions actively in the Q and A. Um, we're just about out of time, and I have just two more um, reminders. Please continue this conversation with us in the Claris community. Um, there have been a lot of great discussions about the 19.5 release already. Um, both people sharing what they're excited about and how they're starting to use some of these new features, and um, then also. Many, many product issues have already been reported, and we use those early reports to drive and prioritize the things we would fix in that update or that Rick said is coming soon. Um, in addition, I just wrote one more time, we're going to publish the webinar Q&A transcript to the community in the FileMaker topic, probably this afternoon or first thing tomorrow. Um, and the engineering blogs are all accessible right from the community homepage, and there's tons of excellent information there. Um, and in closing, please, please, please let us think what, about what you thought about today's webinar by completing our short survey. Your feedback goes a long way to help us improve our presentations, and it guides what we'll present in future webinars. Thank you. Hope to see you in the community soon. <laughs>